The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. You've always got time for short time. Hey, it's Warren Lopez. David Taylor. Fred Metcalf. Johnny Hendricks. Tony Ramos. Bubba J. Mike Gold. Matthew Modine. The one and only Chael Sonnen. And you are listening to the one and only Short Time Wrestling Podcast by the often imitated and never duplicated Jason Bryant. As we get started here on the Short Time Wrestling Podcast, and Emma Randall and I just kind of joking around about how we've grown as people since uh, since I left USA Wrestling. But Emma is the only woman in the United States who is gold certified coach, and she is an assistant national team coach under Coach Terry Steiner, along with Clarissa Chun. Emma, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks, Jason. I'm glad to be here. You know, our first formal interview, like ever. I mean, it's like when you were interning at USA Wrestling. Terry's office is upstairs. Mine was upstairs. It was basically like, who can we like joke around with in the office? Like, okay, hey, there's Emma. But uh, what's going back to your career? It's been kind of an interesting path to follow. You grew up in Ohio. Uh, where did you first discover wrestling? Uh, I fell in love with wrestling watching my brother practice. I'm from a small family. Um, while my brother was on the mat, I was forced to watch his wrestling. And so I spent my time on the side shadowing what he was doing, um, trying to earn my place on the mat. So at, at what age were you and you said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this actually. I'm actually going to compete, not just like roll around. Uh, I wanted to get on the mat when I started kindergarten. However, uh, my parents and some of the coaches around didn't quite have the same ideas. Uh, by the time I made it to third grade, I had been practicing with the guys during their season, but I was never allowed to compete. Finally, um, they let me on the mat and I got to compete and I ended up placing second in the state that year. So. What were some of those early hurdles besides just like, okay, you're not going to wrestle, but, uh, you know, we're looking back, women's wrestling's been accepted for a while now, but still, when you're at the younger age groups, it doesn't seem to be a big problem until you start winning. Uh, you know, I think some, hurt, <laughs> some hurdles that I faced were the fact that I didn't see another female wrestler until I was a sophomore in high school. So immediately I thought something was wrong with me. Why would I love this sport that there's not a lot of other people who, who truly care about it and, and are in it? Uh, and then I think there's a lot of pressure that comes with winning. They expect repeated wins. Uh, it's hard to continue success, especially at a young age, because you're growing, constantly changing. You might think within your own perspective that you're the hardest working person in the state or in the country, but really you're not, right? It's your own perspective and seeing how great a lot of these other kids are and how hard they're working too. So I think as far as barriers I faced, it was not getting around other women. And secondly, uh, I think just winning's hard, you know? When you got on the senior level, you were, you were at a higher weight class. How much does the growth affect with women's wrestling? Because when you're, you're the same size, of, you know, little guys and little girls, okay, the strength issue isn't as, as much. They're, you know, you can be, be technical, you can be just as strong as boys. And as the women start to grow into those bigger, more, I guess, stronger weight classes for the boys, how does that affect your psyche when, when the success might not come as much as it was against the boys beforehand as you go to a bigger weight class? Oh, it's so hard. So hard. My sophomore year, I finished the boys' season. I was wrestling like 112. Uh, by the time USGWA Nationals rolled around, I was wrestling 138. <laughs> so I hit a growth spurt, and it wasn't just a small one. I moved from the scrawny, skinny boys to the men. And I went from being successful in some positions to not being su successful at all. And it actually... Uh, deterred my desire to even be in the sport because I started questioning, do I really belong with these people? Um, that's when I found wrestling women. Um, that's when I truly saw that I can hang with women who are my own size. What I can use the guys for are drilling opportunities, for getting more mat time, for feeling different positions and getting a different feel than I would wrestling a female. So it's, there's pros and cons with everything, right, Jason? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't want to wrestle any girls my size. That would have been really bad for probably me but as we look at going from high school and then you went to lock haven why why lock haven after high school there were there were some women's college programs at that time but uh, ultimately why'd you head to uh i, I lived in pennsylvania so i can say it i can say pennsylvania <laughs> I'm a Haven Nationer for life. I, I love the Haven. But um, when I graduated high school, I knew my senior year that I wanted to play collegiate sports. I played a lot of sports in high school. My, my junior and senior year of high school, I played basketball. I was terrible. Basically, they just used me to hit people. Um, so I would practice with the boys when I could. I played basketball. Uh, and then during the girls' seasons, I would wrestle girls because 
it just wasn't quite the opportunity that I wanted at those upper weights against the guys. So I was playing tennis, track, wrestling, and basketball all of my, my throughout my high school career. So I really knew that sports are my passion. Uh, honestly, I thought I was going to play tennis, and I just really wanted to skip school one day and go on a college visit. And I thought, you know, you get a college day, so why not drive to Lock Haven? And it ended up being during the snowstorm, and we're driving through central Pennsylvania, which you know is full of mountains. <laughs> and, and so we're going up and down, and it's getting prettier and prettier. And we stopped finally when we got to Lock Haven. And I got out, and there was a snowflake the size of my hand. Uh, Lock Haven was wrestling Penn State that day. I met Sharon Taylor, uh, our athletic director at the time. I loved our coach, Coach Fike. I loved our our uh, sport administration program, and that's what I wanted to study. And I knew right there in that 24-hour span that that's where I wanted to be, and that would be my home. So that's what made the decision easy for me. Uh, Jenny Wong and Sarah McMahon had come through Lock Haven before you, and even though it wasn't a formal varsity program, uh, you know you mentioned Terry Fike and uh, bringing Lock ha- women's wrestling to Lock Haven beyond uh, Jenny and Sarah. What was that opportunity like to kind of blaze a trail a little bit, even though it's still not a varsity sport at Lock Haven? But that opportunity, what did the school provide you as far as wrestling opportunities? Uh, the school treated us like varsity athletes. They took us to competitions. They sent us overseas. Uh, we were constantly training, competing. They they loved us. They put their arms around us and included us. I think what made my transition a little bit easier is uh, Carl Poff, the former coach at Lock Haven, was actually my student advisor. Uh, so I got to have him in class. I got to sit and talk with him whenever I needed to chat. And he truly wrapped his arms around me and, and told us that we were important and that although we were a small team, that we had big goals and that with the support, we could achieve whatever we wanted to. So. How much did he look back at the opportunities that, that Sarah and Jenny had at Lock Haven to, to you know, imprint on, on your, your experience? Right. He, he encouraged us to stick with it. You know, things are not always going to be easy. You're always fighting for a space. You know, I'd like to say that women's wrestling uh, is accepted by everyone, but it's not. You know, I think uh, it's been a long time since our first world championships, but some of us are still fighting to get on that mat. So. Uh, he reminded us where the program was and where it is today and to look at the bigger picture and see the growth and believe that because the people in front of us could do it, so could we. Uh, both both Coach Poff and uh, Terry Fike were, were great about that. And you mentioned Sharon Taylor, longtime AD there, who has not exactly been the most uh, highly thought of person in some circles in the wrestling community. You're speaking very highly of her. What was it? What was her? What was your experience like with her as a female athlete and wrestler specifically that that may kind of differ from the opinions that may prevail in the wrestling community? You know, first thing that St. showed me was the on my recruiting visit, she didn't have to talk to me. Uh, we're not a varsity sport. We're not some program, a Division One program, and I wasn't some five-star recruit walking in on campus. She came in. She shook my hand. She knew my name. She knew my mom's name. She knew where I was from. Uh, and from that day forward, anytime I walked through that athletic department and I walked through the office and her door was open, she would say, hi, Emma. And that's how our relationship starts. And I think that's, that's one of the things that drew me to her right away because she truly cared about us. She took the time to know us. She took the time to respect us. Um, as a female participating in sports for her, uh, I think it's motivating to know that you can see a powerful female achieving dreams. And really, she was a trailblazer. Yeah. And, you know, she's done a lot for sport, a lot for women's sport. Uh, I think you can see anybody as good, good or bad, depending on the perspective that you choose to look at. And I choose to see the opportunity she provided to, to athletes instead of the opportunities that maybe other people feel that they were slighted by her. What do you think her position was on, on wrestling? even though some of the wrestling fans didn't think she was a fan of wrestling. Well, you know, is that true or false? I saw her in the stands at almost every wrestling meet. Uh, anytime I walked through the athletic department after a competition, she would ask us how it went. She, she would stop by and check in on us and see how we were doing with our coach and stop by and check in on practice and see that we were being loved on and, and working hard at the same time. And I saw her in the stands. I know that she always knew what was going on within our program. So to say that she's not a fan of wrestling is probably not true. Uh, Wrestling is a huge sport in Lock Haven, and I think she knows that. Uh, So I think she truly was cheering people on, whether they like to believe that or not. When it came to your, your, your competitive career, at what point did you realize that, okay, I'm probably not going to be on that stage, even though you want to be on that stage. I mean, at what point do you say, okay, 
it's time to not compete and start coaching? When, or did you always want to be a coach as long as you're a competitor? I mean, when does when does the competition stop and the coaching begin in your mind? I picked up a coaching minor the very first semester I was at Lock Haven, so I knew that's what I wanted to be at some point, at some level within within wrestling or within sport. Um, so that w- that was an easy choice for me. Knowing when to quit wrestling was the hard choice. Uh, it became unfun. It became a job. It became this burden that I was carrying around, and it was crushing me. Um, so along with my coaching minor, I had to take uh, some sports psychology classes and also some psych of coaching classes. And from there, I kind of fell in love with that idea, and it, it helped me a lot get through dealing with the burden of sport and making it an opportunity and, and starting to love it again. I think I just picked up those classes a little bit too late to save myself. (laughs) So um, that's why I picked up a minor in sports psychology. uh, And then I knew that I was done after university nationals in my senior year. I had a poor performance. Um, I was really down on myself. And I realized that wrestling shouldn't define me. I shouldn't feel like that performance, I guess, when I got back, people asked me, you know, Why did you lose? Well, it's not a reason of why I lost. There's a lot of great people in this country. Um, I just am not technically there. I'm not one of those best people in the country. So I knew I was done. I didn't want that to define me anymore. So I started looking at opportunities within the sport of wrestling. I was going to be graduating that fall or that spring. And I had been talking to Noel Thompson while he was the president at the New York Athletic Club. And things kind of fell through with my internship with him. And so uh, Coach Poff, he's like, I came into his office crying and I have like a 3.8 GPA and I'm like, coach, I I really don't know what I'm going to do. I I need an internship to graduate. I feel like I'm a great student. I feel like I have a lot to offer somebody. And he's like, well, where do you want to be? And I said, I want to be within wrestling. I want it to be something that I am passionate about. And he said, well, let's start from the top and we'll work back. Start with uh, Coach Steiner. And I had been out at the OTC for training camps quite a, quite a bit during my four years at Lock Haven. And so I called him up. And without any hesitation, he, he said, well, you can come out here June 1st. We can have an internship. And I was like, what, really? And he was like, I don't know what you'll do, but we'll figure it out when you get here. So uh, that's what I did. I packed my bags. And June 1st, I started at USA Wrestling right across the hall from the famous and notorious Jason Bryant. More around the corner. I think you're let's see, actually where was he? You were yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you asked were you sharing space with, with Terry, right? And then across from the Nuge. And then I was yeah, okay. So basically me and Emma would cross at the at the water cooler. Lit, quite literally all the time. So the opportunity to go to the training center wasn't to be an athlete, it was to be a coach. And then when did the whole coaching education situation come through because USA Wrestling's done a lot. Cody Bickley started in that national coach's education position. He's now a high performance manager, but there's a lot of coaching education that came through USA Wrestling for everybody else. Now you're here with an internship. First of all, when, what went in your internship and when did the coaching education part of it really start to say, hey, I can, I, can, I can get this certification, I can get this certification. How did that work? Uh, really, my internship was office work, and what they were using me for, was it was the summer of 2012 before the London Olympics, and Allie Bernard and I had a great relationship, and Terry told me, you know, why don't you come down to practice, because that's what my everyday looks like, I think that's what yours should look like, and I said, do you want me to wrestle, do you want me to stand, do you want me to sit, do you want me to put my stuff on, and he was like, no, just put your stuff on, so I ended up being basically a drilling partner for Allie that summer, and um I didn't really say much as far as technical advice to her or really to anyone because, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, she's the Olympian and I'm 21 years old and I have no titles to my name that would ever compare to, you know, anything within most of those people in the room. So I was kind of just like a backseat driver doing a lot of office work. Uh, the Olympics came and went. Uh, the non-Olympic worlds came and went. Terry came back and he said, you know I really appreciate what you've done for us. When does your internship end? And I said, ended a month ago, but um, (laughs) you weren't here, so I stayed because I still want an A-plus on this internship. I'm trying to protect my GPA here. And so so he he said, all right, well, I really appreciate it. And I said, well, my lease doesn't end until December, so I'd like to stay and continue it and really get some more field experience while I can. He said, that's great. And then the next weekend, uh, Coach Izzy called Terry and said, we need to have a meeting. And that's when Izzy left our staff and took a a teaching job, a principal job uh, in town. So on Sunday, Terry calls me and he always calls me at the crack of dawn. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm sleeping like a normal human. (laughs) And uh, he says, he says, well, can you meet me at like 2 p.m.? And I was like, "Okay, whatever. And then 1 p.m. rolls around or sorry, the next hour goes by and he says, 
calls me back. He said, can you, can we go at one? And then like half an hour later, he says, can we go at noon? And then he calls me again. He said, can you just come now? So I drive to the office on a Sunday early in the morning and I find out that Izzy is left and that he wants to hire me as a program assistant. So it still wasn't a coaching role. He said that we kind of just play that by ear. I told him the coaching was something that I'm interested in, but I'm not really sure if I belong here. And he said, you just need to spend some time on the mat and become comfortable with yourself and start believing in yourself and trusting in what you know. Uh, so I started working with some of our younger athletes at that time who were about my age or a little bit younger. And those were the people who I was really, truly sharing advice with. Not very much, but still finding my voice within the wrestling room. And then that spring, I got added to the clip on open to our staff. So they were like, hey, you need to get your bronze certification to make this happen. So that's how I got involved. I got my toes wet with clip on and the bronze certification. And then as we were progressing into the summer, we were talking about how do we make our coaching staff better? How do we make our program staff better? And how do we improve ourselves? So the first thing I thought was, I, I, I'm a student. I love taking classes. I, I was doing my master's at that time, too. And so I started taking the silver course and started working towards it. And then a year later, I started working towards the gold, co- the gold, gold course. Sorry, I can't talk. With uh, Mike Clayton and... Finally, it seemed like forever, but finally I had enough credits and it, it happened. So that's that's kind of how it came about. I think the process was great. There was a lot of learning experiences and also a lot of writing and reflecting going on throughout that. Um, I think there was a lot of research because, you know, you have to do your own project within the uh, gold certification programming. So that, that helped me as well because, again, I'm a student and I like that kind of stuff. I like learning. I like growing. So. It worked really well for me, and I truly believed in it. And the thing they kept telling me it was that it's it, it's going to happen. Somebody's going to get that gold certification, so who's going to be the first person? And, you know, that's that's great that I was the first person, but I think there's going to be a lot more coming. So, Yeah, so uh, when they say you're the first, how quickly did they realize, wait a minute, do we have anyone? Who did, did they go ask her? I was like, hey, wait, does Trisha have her gold? No. How did, how did, you, how did you guys find out that you were, you were going to be the first? Um... Honestly, I didn't even really think about, like, the first part. I just knew that I wanted to be gold. I wanted to show that I was pursuing uh, and pursuing that coaching certification and, and improving myself so I could have some more credibility within myself and confidence in myself as a coach. Um, so then coach uh, Mike Clayton and I were sitting there, and he's counting up the credits, you know, on his laptop, and he's like, oh, wow, you have it. And then he's like, you know, uh, that's really awesome. And then I walk out of his office and he pulls it up and then he he emails me. He's like, you're the 69th coach. He's like, but you're actually the first the first woman. I'm like, oh, okay, well, awesome. That's that's great. Let's use this to to spread, you know, that this sort this certification exists because I as an athlete never knew that there were levels of coaching. Um, And secondly, let's let's use it to bring more people in it. Now, I have to ask this one question to set up the next question, but how much do you follow collegiate wrestling in terms of on the Division One men's wrestling side of things? Uh, I follow Lockhaven. <laughs> okay, so uh, you're, you're familiar. They went through a coaching hire or two in, in your tenure and then in, in the past year. So when you look at credentials, so many people look at hires at the Division One level, like, oh, if you're not an All-American or National Champion, you're not getting looks for a coaching job. Whereas you look at basketball, there are, there are coaches in the NBA that never did anything as superstars at, at the college level. You're a gold certified coach. You're on the assistant coach of the women's national team, yet your credentials don't seem to live up to that. How, how much do you have to like kind of fight that? Or is there even a, a people going, well, what, what are her credentials? Why is she the coach? I mean, how do you deal with basically being a better coach than you were an athlete? You know, honestly, there's still a lot of self-doubt. You know, I I can't lie to you, um, but I do think that you never have, by the way. <laughs> I do think that you know, just because there's not a medal around your me- neck doesn't mean that you can't tell that their ear's not tight to the person that they're shooting on. Just because you didn't win a medal around your neck doesn't mean you don't know how to sprawl. I think there's a lot of things that I couldn't do physically as an athlete. So as a coach, I pay a lot of attention to uh, watching technique, paying attention to what's going on and, and how can we improve our positions. And it worked out really well the first year that I was within the program and more than just an intern was a year that we spent every day, two hours a day for the first six months. 
learning technique. And we did position by position by position. If I do this and my opponent does this, what do I do for a reaction? What do I do for a reaction? And I have notebooks upon notebooks upon notebooks of notes and thinking about those things and elaborating. And that's the kind of way that my brain works is how can I piece these things together and understand a situation on how to react. And I think, you know, Maybe some things that came easy to people who have medals around their neck, which there's nothing against them. I, I'm not saying that if, you, if you're talented that you can't coach. I'm just saying that a lot of things that might have come easy for them, I spent a lot of time watching, you know, and thinking about and spending time feeling it within myself and watching the athletes do it. And how can I break this down into something more fundamental? How can I show them in a way that makes more sense? So, you know, I, I think attention to detail is something that, as my personality trait, I, I have, but also um, as a coach, it's really, it's really helped me. This is always the hindsight question because I've been around wrestling for, you know, over 20 something years. And I look back and I go, seeing as much wrestling as I've seen, I go, man, I'd, I'd really like to wrestle myself as a high school kid to see what, what I know now compared to what I knew then. Do you ever think about looking at your career going, man, if I had just known this then or know, know then what I know now? Oh my gosh, there's so many things I'd like to change. Holy cow. Probably if the double knee pads first would be the first thing to go. Uh, possibly the headgear as well. But, you know, of the things that I want to change, I think that path of, of losses and, and just growing as a person and understanding that there's more to life than wrestling, but wrestling can be a big part of who I am. Wow, that was scary. I thought we were getting shot at. Uh, uh, but, you know. It's Greece. I'm surprised they didn't go, Opa. <laughs> That was a bottle of wine, though, I think. Um, <laughs> not a yeah, not a bullet. But, you know, the, those, those failures and those setbacks made me who I am today, so I probably wouldn't change much. There's been a lot of reorganization, so to speak, within USA Wrestling. We've seen uh, Joe Russell come in on the freestyle side. Gary Mayab come in in Greco. Uh, Cody Bickley has, has moved into a, a, a high-performance manager role since, we, well, since I left and you started there. Mike Clayton's come aboard. You mentioned him. I knew Mike from back in the days as a coach of the apprentice school. What have you seen internally at the office that has you, I guess, geeked out or amped up for women's wrestling that also has you know, maybe draw some of the, the firepower from the junior men's freestyle title, the, the senior men's freestyle title, the women's runner up finish at the world championships. I mean, there's a lot of energy, but what are some things internally that have really helped the coaches within that office in Colorado Springs? I, you know, I think as far as an organization, what we do well is that we're never complacent. I think every six months we submit a high performance plan to the USOC. Uh, it's required to say how we're going to get better. What steps are we going to take? What detailed plan are we going to take? How are we going to fund it? How are we going to make what our goals are a reality? And I think that's something that uh, USA Wrestling has pushed on their coaches. It's constantly evolving, constantly evaluating, reflecting, looking at that bigger process. Um, I think as far as Taking the energy of what's at USA Wrestling from our recent success, I think it's a, we're in a good place. You know, people are watching wrestling more so than they were before. I think people are interested in that Freestyle World Cup in Iowa. I think the important piece is that we, we use all of these platforms to show all of wrestling. Greco, women's freestyle, men's freestyle, and really show how great all of us are. Because... We have a great message. We have great stories. All of our people are, are just amazing athletes, coaches, people around the sport. So I think if we use this momentum to show the world how great we are, we can truly move wrestling from something that's struggling to get those high school participants to the forefront. And as far as the team unity goes, you guys are excited when the men's freestyle does well. You guys are excited when the Greco team does well, just like they're excited when the women's team does well. What is one thing that you feel the wrestling community could do to be excited, not just for a men's freestyle world championship, but to, to get on the message boards and Twitter and social media and talk about how great it was of, of the, the, the silver medal finish for, for the women or, or, you know, beyond Helen's just destroying everybody, but be stoked for Becca's medal or be stoked for Ali Silver just as much as they would be Helen because they see her as, uh, for lack of a better term, wrestling like a guy, wrestling that type of dominant style. How can we change the mindset to be, instead of being a men's wrestling fan or a freestyle fan, to be a wrestling fan? I think the main idea is that everybody wrestles. Whether you're an actual wrestler or not, all of us wrestle with something in life. And knowing that all those athletes to get on that big stage work their butts off. And knowing that 
they've sacrificed a lot to be there, knowing that they've spent time away from their family, time overseas, time training, uh, money that they could have made in any other sport or in any other job. <laughs> and they chose wrestling because it's their passion. And I think it's respecting every athlete for what they're giving to you as a fan to watch. I think you've got to go, you've got to give it back to them because they're the true heroes. You know, I think whether you're a Greco guy, a, a woman's freestyler or a men's freestyler, you, you deserve a lot of glory and a lot of, a lot of media attention. Mentioning Helen, what did that mean for you as a woman's wrestler last year when she won gold, becoming the first, first American woman to do that? You know, for me, it feels like the four minute mile. You know, they say it can't be done. We can't beat Japan. They say we'll never get a gold medal. This girl will never get never get beaten. And, you know, David slayed the Goliath. You know, that's kind of what it's like. And now everybody's eyes are open and you and what seemed impossible now seems possible and it seems attainable. And it's something that we can physically touch. And it's recent enough that it inspired a lot of people. You know, it's not something that happened 30 years ago and we haven't done it since. It's something that happened a year ago. You know, it's something that's still new. And when we move into 2020, instead of expecting one gold medal, we want to be expecting six. And with with Helen being kind of a focal point of women's wrestling recently, and then now wrestle like a girl, Sally Roberts and crew have really gotten that moving and the emerging status progress is something that's exciting. What's that mean for you? Because you went to an NCAA institution, a lot of the a lot of the schools that are uh, have women's wrestling programs are NAIA. Uh, there's a couple of NCAA schools that have had existing teams, or either they've reclassified or not. But coming from a school with a Division One wrestling program, to say, wow, it, eventually we could have a Division One women's wrestling team at your alma mater, and getting all this thing rolling. I mean, what's what's the wrestle like a girl in the emerging sports status mean to you? Oh, uh, wrestle like a girl is very personal. I think uh, it's changing the connotation that what it truly means to wrestle like a girl and what it truly means to wrestle is a wrestler defined by their gender or is a wrestler defined by someone who's resilient, somebody who's strong, somebody who's bold, somebody who's confident. And I think that's the dialogue that we need to be changing and, and creating amongst ourselves. I think getting NCAA sanctioning is going to help our sport tremendously. It's what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Does it the state high school sanctioning come first or does the NCAA sanctioning? And you know what? We're taking our chances because we're pushing on both ends. Uh, we've got states that we think are low-hanging fruit that we can push towards sanctioning in the next upcoming year. And we've got a great NCAA emerging sports status bid that was helped put together by Wrestle Like a Girl, USA Wrestling, the USOC, uh, the National Hall of Fame, you know, uh, It's a really good feeling the day that we submit that bid, hearing from our USOC um, Olympic sport liaison that works with the NCAA, telling us that this was a very well put together bid and that they feel very confident in it as well. So, you know, that's a lot of that's a lot of confidence that we can take. And I think getting in the door and getting them to look at our bid is great. But I think when we present in April that's when we're going to change their minds, because truly, I think hearing our stories and hearing the the impact of wrestling, they can't say no to that. You know, I think the character that it builds, I think the experiences that it teaches and brings and provides for athletes uh, and just for humans in general is something that a lot of sports do offer, but I think we do it better. Now, getting away from wrestling, if that's possible, because a lot of wrestling people, especially coaches, are wrestling, wrestling, wrestling all the time. When you need to decompress and get away from wrestling, what are, what are some activities that Colorado Springs has presented to you that, that makes one living there great and being able to say, okay, there, I actually, I'm at a place where, yes, I work at USA Wrestling, I'm a coach, but I can have a life outside of wrestling. Uh, for me, you'll find me in nature. Uh, it's either hiking until I get to the point where my mind clears and I kind of work through this internal dialogue of what we can do better and how I can be better and how our athletes can be better um, until finally there's some clarity and there's just peace within myself. Um, some other things I do is I hike up to the top of a mountain, set up my hammock and start reading or uh, just watch Netflix that I might have downloaded. Um, <laughs> Most recently, I drove over to the Mount Princeton Hot Springs and spent the day by myself in the in the spa and just really rested myself and reset because, you know, sometimes sometimes life is draining in itself. And then to add to the fact that a coaching is a selfless job, it's not about you. It's not about your wins or your athletes. It's about us. 
It's about what you're giving to the kid in front of you, what you're giving to the young lady in front of you. It's about what you're providing to the program. It's about what you're providing to the coaches next to you and giving that energy and that love and the attention to detail and bringing the things that they might not have with them in that moment. And that's draining within itself. I'm not an extrovert person. I'm an introvert who pretends to be an extrovert. So that our athletes get that spark that they might need. So for me, I've got to reset. I've got to recharge. And taking care of myself is is a super important thing because if I can't give any more, then I'm doing a disservice to to the athletes. So what did you download and binge on Netflix on this trip? <laughs> okay, so I've watched a lot of shows. So I'm these are like my third string picks. But I'm recently really into Borgia. It's about... Um, I really like history as well, so forgive me. But uh, it's about a pope. (laughs) and uh, I'm checking out right there. (laughs) Yeah. It's about a pope and his family and the power struggle. So um, within the Romans, uh, how do you get to the top? How do you stay on top? The backstabbing, the the plotting, you know, the long-term game because, you know, you lose a lot of matches. uh, You give up a lot of points to win the match. And, you know, how do you stay on top and control the power of – at that time, one of the most influential um, countries in the world, you know. So I think this, there's some weird, weird, uh, I guess, kind of parallels, but not really. <laughs> uh, I'm more of a House of Cards kind of lady, but, you know, when House of Cards is an update for another year, you've got to find your political needs elsewhere. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I've got three episodes left of House of Cards, although the Europeans, I, I got jet lagged and I ended up starting Designated Survivor. And I think I watched 18 episodes of that in a row uh, as, as we, uh, we we move forward. You ever look back you're, you're coaching at the Cadet World Championships. You were in Paris. You've been around the world. You ever look back and be like coming out of high school, be like, I am coaching wrestling in Athens, like at the same facility that, you know, Cale Sanderson won his gold medal, the same facility that women's wrestling was an Olympic sport for the very first time. And the first two medalists, Patricia and Sarah come away with medals in this building. Do you have to pinch yourself at all? You know, I think about that a lot. There wasn't a lot of high expectations. I think when I graduated high school, um, I'm from a really small town. We've got two stoplights. I went to Greenview. I graduated with less than 200 people in my class. Um, I grew up on a farm. My parents owned a feed store (laughs) and I'm traveling the world doing something that I love, um, coaching some of the best athletes in the world. And it's, it's unreal, you know, to, to really live this life and to have this opportunity. I'm truly grateful for Terry picking up the phone that day and telling me to pack my bags. So Terry, the notorious low talker. Okay. You gotta, you gotta throw us some funny Terry stories here. Cause we've, I know we've both got plenty actually Ravens here. His daughter's floating around too. And she, or watching some of the videos we did like eight years ago when I was working there. But what is, what are some Terryisms that people realize like this guy, this guy, this guy needs some social awareness sometimes. <laughs> uh, I guess I'd start with my internship right away. I spent six months literally two feet across the desk from him and he would send me emails of what I should be working on. (laughs) No social skills. At the end of my internship, I got a report back and it was like such a great worker, all these details. And I'm like, he didn't say a single thing to me that made me thought that made me think that I could even like do anything right. And so, yeah, yeah, I was, I was going to be upset. Uh, Some other Terry things, you know, again, he calls me all the time in the morning at like six o'clock. What are you doing? Uh, we do workouts together. We do coach workouts and, um, we'll, we'll show up at the gym and I'll say, what do you want to do today? And he says, I don't know. And then he'll reach into his duffel bag and pull out a printed workout. Um, (laughs) and and then we'll do the printed workout, which is like supersets of four exercises, like 15 times through, you know, cause he's an Iowa wrestler. So he's relentless. And then I'm thinking, I'm thinking that we're done. And he's like, grab a, grab a barbell. He's like, hold it over your head. Let's see if we can hold it for five minutes. I'm like, what is this doing? This isn't even real strength. They're just holding something, you know? So he, you never know what he's going to say, what he's going to do. He's, he's wild. Over my time with him, though, I think some of the, some of the most fun things have been off the map, uh, sightseeing, uh, just exploring. We spent a day in Hungary on bikes, sightseeing the city with e- just each other. Uh, going site to site to site, kind of relaxing, decompressing. Uh, most recently, you'll have to ask him about this, he uh, got to ride on Chris Pendleton's bike handlebars <laughs> through the streets of Paris. You know, so. What are we, 12? <laughs> 
this is quite a sight to see, Jason. I think I think the world should see it. I'm not sure if the world's ready for that video, but I do know Flo possess it. <laughs> so, um, you know, he's always surprised, always always something with Terry. So I I can't work for a better guy, you know, and I can't beat Chun either. She's a pretty good pretty good coworker. <laughs> is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.